Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Prime Minister Harper, Your Highness, my brother, <laughs> Madame Clarkson, Excellencies, Ms. Shelley Glover, Minister of Canadian Heritage and Official Languages, Honourable Ministers, Chancellor de Breuil, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends. What a pleasure it is to welcome you to this exceptional place on this most special day. Exceptional because we are inaugurating today not one, but two new and unique buildings facing each other across a new and unique park, two utterly unusual pieces of architecture, housing surprising reflections of beauty. This is also a special moment because of the special role that we expect the Aga Khan Museum to play as a gateway into the history and artistic traditions of the Muslim world, nearly a fifth of humanity. And for those non-Muslims and even Muslims who wish better to understand that world. The Aga Khan Museum will play this role at a time when such a gateway is profoundly needed. All across the planet, political and economic developments, the forces of globalization, are connecting Muslim and non-Muslim societies ever more intimately, and yet, at the same time, misunderstandings between those worlds are becoming an increasingly dangerous threat. Expanded and improved means of communication can as easily be used to cause divisions and fragmentation as they can to uni unify and breed understanding. Despite the advances we have witnessed through improved technology and through globalization, a knowledge gap continues to exist and perhaps even grow. And the result of that gap is a vacuum within which myths and stereotypes can so easily fester, fed by the ampli amplification of extreme minority voices. Symbols become confused with emblems. Imagery of demagoguery or despotism, of intolerance and conflict, come to dominate in such an environment with global repercussions. That context is precisely the reason that the potential contribution of an institution such as the Arkan Museum can be so important. I believe strongly that art and culture can have a profound impact in healing misunderstanding and in fostering trust even across great divides. This is the extraordinary purpose, the special mandate to which this museum is dedicated. Yali Medet, welcome and bienvenue. Thank you for joining us for another Friday Night Reflections. My name is Rahim Ladani. I'd like to start by extending a special welcome to all of our Jamaati members, multi-faith family members, and to everyone tuning in and watching from across the country and around the world. I'm joining you from Toronto, where the temperatures have started to warm up, most of the snow has melted, and it really feels like we're starting to turn a corner. However, Hair salons are still not open. I know you're watching thinking, what is going on with his hair? I haven't had a haircut in six months. I'm sorry, but I digress. I know some of you watching at home have had the opportunity to get your first dose of the vaccine. My grandparents have, and I have to tell you, it was an incredibly proud moment for me. Just thinking about how resilient they've been throughout this global pandemic, from learning how to use an iPad, to now knowing how to log on to Zoom, to even learning how to use the mute function so that when they don't want us to hear what they're saying. Think about that. Now, as the light shines brighter on the end of lockdowns and more institutions reopen, at least partially, I've been thinking about places I can't wait to visit once the restrictions pass. One of those places is the Aga Khan Museum. Tonight's episode will not only whet your appetite for when we can return, but also feature some of the changes that the museum has made in light of COVID that allow it to reach more people across the country and across the world. First, tonight, we will be joined by Dr. Elrika Alhamis, the Interim Director and CEO of the Aga Khan Museum, for a discussion on the mission of the museum, the challenges the pandemic has presented, and the direction for the future. We're then going to have a few special segments looking at what is going on at the museum now, including at the remastered exhibition, the Spring is Here exhibition at the Aga Khan Park, and some insight into the Aga Khan Museum's gift shop. 
Now, because it's Friday night, later on, we're also going to have some fun. We're gonna play a game and test our knowledge of the Aga Khan Museum with the family favorite, the Kahoot Quiz. Tonight, we're also going to bring back COVID conversations. It's a segment where we take a closer look at comparing different vaccines and why it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Then, we're going to conclude with a musical expression of a concert held at the Aga Khan Museum just before the world locked down. So grab some chai, some leftover Navro sweets, as we now welcome Dr. Alrika Alhamis, Interim Director and CEO of the Aga Khan Museum. We would like to start with a message from the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson, the 26th Governor General of Canada. In this short clip, Madam Clarkson makes an eloquent case for how and why it's important to anchor ourselves in traditions that may not be our own. What the Aga Khan Museum is able to do for us is to give us this feeling that we are anchored in something that is a different tradition and one which can enrich us in a much different way than what we are used to. And that's what the meaning of having a museum like this uh, really in the center of this very populous region of Canada means. This museum contributes to understanding and understanding contributes to dialogue and dialogue contributes to peace. As long as people are talking, they aren't fighting, and that's what this place has been able to do. Dr. Elrika Alhamis, thank you so much for joining us and sitting down with us and making time for us for this week's Friday Night Reflections. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. So the topic and the focus of tonight's show is to better understand the Aga Khan Museum, what it's all about, what it represents, and also how it's adapting as we move through and inshallah, hopefully soon, come out of the global pandemic. And so I wanted to start by talking about when the museum was built. If I can take you back to September 2014, nearly seven years ago when the doors first opened, what was the vision for the museum? Why was the museum built? Well, as you know, the museum was quite a time in inception because the initial idea started in the early 2000s in the context of a world that was at loggerheads with each other. Uh, in the wake of September 11th, the West and the East were screaming at each other through the media. The West and the Muslim world um, was fighting with each other, was no longer listening to each other. And of course, at that point in time, His Highness really was concerned about what he called the clash of ignorances. And it was in that context that the idea for the museum was born as an extension to the ICT and of course also incorporating an idea for the Aga Khan Park to link the two um, projects. And the vision for the museum was to really create a hub where people could come and learn with each other, about each other, through the medium of Muslim arts and culture. Because at that time, when people were not listening to each other and the existential conflict between two civilizations was gathering pace, art was the most perfect medium to actually bring people together. And interestingly enough, today, where we are living through another existential conflict and another existential crisis globally, the arts have again proven to be the place where people seek solace, where they seek hope and inspiration, and where the museum therefore has a renewed role to play to offer um, new conversations, new horizons, and solutions through the arts. It's interesting that you blend 
the themes from nearly seven years ago to where we are today. And I think there are, is a, there's a common thread over there, but as time goes on, it's natural for things to evolve. And we're going through our own crisis right now, but even outside of the global pandemic, as time evolves, we're forced to evolve with it. And so I'm curious because as your position as CEO and interim director of the museum, from your perspective, What's changed in that vision? I understand what's been the same, but what's changed in that vision to adapt to where we are in a society today? Well, ironically, the most recent crisis has given us an unprecedented opportunity to consider taking the mandate globally. So our aspiration is looking into the future to grow our um, global impact, to grow our global reach and our global audiences, and to really move ourselves to the discourse of um, cultures coming together and reimagining a better world post-COVID. And in all that, of course, our need a year ago to move our activities into the digital domain has actually spurred us on to evolve on the digital platform and to really think of innovative products of education and learning for a wide range of different audiences that can help us take our mandate, our view of the world, our commitment to pluralism and the coming together of cultures beyond conflict and beyond misunderstanding. So this is where the great change is lying ahead, being able to take what we believe in into the global domain. So I want to ask you about the art in the museum itself. When you look at a museum, the Aga Khan Museum is no different from others in the sense that there are permanent exhibits that we see all the time and then there are rotating exhibits that come from time to time. Is there a direct link when we look at the art that comes into the museum and Hazri Mam's vision? Is there a direct link there in terms of the input and the message that we want it to convey? Absolutely, absolutely. And because of his mandate and his support and encouragement for doing things differently through the arts, there are so many stories surrounding our objects that allow us to talk about pluralism and the coming together of collections and cultures. And I give you one example of that. We have a very famous artwork in the museum, much beloved, much featured, and that is an ivory horn, an elephant from around the 12th century. And the scholars are still fighting whether it was uh, carved in southern Italy or in Egypt or in Sicily. But never mind. It's made out of an elephant horn. And this elephant horn would originally have come from sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps from regions around Mali or from a big important trading town called Kumbi Saleh, which is now in Mauritania. And it would have been non-Muslim African hunters that would have poached these ivory uh, horns. And of course, today, this is a very um, difficult subject. But in those days, ivory was a luxury commodity. And it would have been Arab and Berber traders that would have then brought it from sub-Saharan Africa to the Mediterranean coast. And from the Mediterranean coast, it would have been largely Italian merchants that would have traded this ivory around the Mediterranean and beyond. Now, wherever the ivory went and wherever it was decorated, in those days, in the late 11th, early 12th century, the master carvers would have been Christians, not Muslims. So for example, if we assume that the horn was carved in Egypt, the master carvers there were Coptic Christians, famous for their wood carving and their ivory carving from well beyond the um, Islamic period. 
Now, in terms of function too, they, these horns were used by both Muslims and Christians in the very same way. They functioned as ceremonial horns at processions or at hunting as hunting horns. Then we have a gap because about 400 years after this horn was decorated somewhere in the southern Mediterranean, it turns up in England, in Norfolk. It turns up at the wedding of an aristocratic uh, couple, Sir John Hare and his bride Elizabeth of Coventry. And on that occasion, the horn gets a silver fitting, which may have been uh, created by a Jewish-English silversmith. And it reflects the um, heraldic symbols of the two aristocratic families. Now, we have no idea how this horn got to England, but interestingly, the bridegroom's family had connections back to crusaders, and it may have come through that connection. In any case, on that occasion, in the context of the wedding, the function of the horn also changes to a European function. It becomes a drinking horn. So then we move from the 17th century to the 19th century. The horn eventually enters the art world and then in the 21st century it travels via Geneva to Toronto. Now if you think across the centuries how many different peoples, how many different religions, how many different professions were involved in this object's trajectory, creation and travels, then you have pluralism in one object. And if you want to take it into the philosophical domain, you can actually say that this object represents a metaphor for our globalized lives and trajectories today, where we might have started in one place and then traveled or were taken across thousands of miles over many years and all the different people that carved, in a sense, into us and made us who we are today, then I think you have an interesting conversation going. You know, Dr. Alhamis, I listened to the story you just told and from where I am in my home to where you are in yours, it seemed like we were sitting right beside each other as you shared that story because I could feel everything you were saying and it goes to show that how art can bring people together and you did a perfect job of describing it. And so I want to know, how do we have that connection? How can we form those connections with other people? And I'm talking about from the younger generation to those across Canada. With COVID, we can't walk through the doors of the museum just yet. So how do we do that? How do we form those bonds and tell the stories like the ones that you just told with other people, no matter where they are? Well, at the moment, of course, we have a wonderful museum without walls where we feature educational resources, educational events, we have global conversations between artists, we have online performances. The other day we had a world premiere of um, digital artwork by Radha Chada and um, she is talking as a microbiologist and an artist and how COVID has actually uh, affected us on the micro, human, uh, natural and universal level. So there are many, many moments where conversation starters are available online. And um, we also have our online collection, of course. So <clears throat> many, many entry points. But in general, if you think about it, you know, if something inspires you, then just tell others and say, hey, did you see this? Isn't that amazing? And once we are back in the museum, if you stand with a fellow human being 
in front of one of our showcases. Why don't you just reach out and look at that person and say, isn't that beautiful? And the conversation will start from that, I bet you, no problem. I couldn't agree more, you know, just just saying two simple words, like a few words, like, isn't that beautiful? And then what both people are thinking, and then they can actually talk about it once it's verbalized. It's incredible. And so I want to ask you about the post-COVID world, you know, as we slowly transition to some degree of normalcy, one day, hopefully soon, we're going to be inside those museum walls. And so when we are inside, what's being done in terms of the transition post-COVID? Well, within the museum, of course, our um, exhibitions will continue. We will work both with uh, local and emerging artists and partners, but also with international partners to bring you really uh, engaging themes and topics. We also, of course, will return to our performing arts events. We will return to our educational events. We are working with our friends in the Aga Khan Park and in the ICT to create joint programming and joint activities, festivals, where people can come together, whatever their background, and just enjoy being with each other, having conversations, perhaps watching a Raptors game on the facade of the museum. And perhaps, if we are lucky, also amble into the museum for their very first ever experience and then um, are inspired and come back. So this is an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I know people like my parents have memberships to the museum and they love going. Any indication of when things will open up so that people can go back in some form, even if it's not to the full scale that we want? <laughs> well, I, I, you have to government, you have to ask the government about that, I'm afraid. I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you one thing that we are ready for reopening. We talk about it every single day. And I can also tell you that our arms will be open to our visitors before our doors. We cannot wait to have you all back to fill our museum with the warmth and the welcome and the feeling of harmony and inclusivity that we want to give everyone who walks through the doors. So um, I'm hoping as soon as possible because digital is all fair and well and I have sung its praises, but ultimately human connection can only really be successful in the long run in the physical world. I couldn't agree more. Now, in your answer, you just mentioned two themes. You said harmony and inclusivity. And so I want to ask you, when any leader steps into a role, whether it's interim CEO and director of the museum or of a Fortune 500 company, when they step into those roles, they step in with a vision and a mandate of their own. And so I'd like to ask you, with you in your position, what's your hope in terms of the direction that you want to take the museum? I came to the museum because I deeply believe in His Highness's vision of making the world a better place. And for me, museum work is social work. And I believe that the arts have a unique potential to make a difference because it's the one medium that can really, really unite people in a non-threatening way. And I have seen it throughout my career that um, miracles are possible through conversations, that were engendered by the arts. And I mean the arts in the widest sense. I do not only speak about visual arts or material arts, I also speak about poetry, music, and even food. Because in many cultures of the world, food is truly and literally an art form. And again, if you look at the amount of people that in this COVID crisis, 
turned to the arts, you realize how powerful it is. And when I was preparing for this talk, I remembered an unbearably powerful moment um, four years ago, no more, six, six years ago, when after a massive explosion in the heart of Baghdad in Iraq, 400 people got killed. The day after a cellist brought his instrument, sat down on the site of the explosion and played his instrument. And it was unbelievable how much that moment meant to people. And it was quite incredible that only two days ago, Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist who is a great friend of our museums, did exactly the same. He took his cello to a vaccination site in Massachusetts, waiting for his injection, and played for the people sitting and waiting in line. So this is what I mean by my belief in the arts. It can change the world, it can turn despair, and it can open new horizons and conversations that make for a better world. I remember watching that video of Yo-Yo Ma a few days ago, and it was a moment of peace in a world of chaos that he brought that was just incredible. And it gave all of us a renewed sense of hope that we will get through this. There is light at the end of that tunnel and that one day we'll all be back together. And so I wanna ask you, you mentioned your vision, the direction you want to see the museum. Where do you see the museum in five years from now? Where are we heading? At the heart of the global discourse, um, really starting new conversations and breaking through conventional barriers in having these conversations, whether that is through an innovative approach to um, a university course, whether it is through uh, pairing conversation partners from around the globe, around something like um, climate change or environmentalism or equity because conventionally when you look at the discourse around Islamic civilizations, around Islamic art, it somehow tends to drop off in the 19th century and the image that people still have is that Muslims were great ones and there's often talk about the golden age of Islam but there's no recognition of the fact that Muslims all over the globe are still making very crucial contributions to the evolution and the positive development of world cultures today. And that is something where a lot of work has to be done and where we are trying really hard to connect the historical with the contemporary, be it through our exhibitions, be it through our living arts, projects and initiatives, or be it through our education programs and our conversations. A couple of things you mentioned there was that there's more of a focus on tackling issues like climate change, equity. Is it your hope that the museum can be used as a vessel to champion that change, whether it's to host conferences or keynote speeches? Absolutely, absolutely. And again, in a unique way, I give you a concrete example. I have been having conversations around the possibility of developing a university module or course um, between the Water Institute at the University of Waterloo and our museum. And the rationale here is that you can use artifacts to talk about the way that humanity has traditionally used water, has respected water, has appreciated the spiritual and cultural significance of water. And that 
what is happening now is in a sense a loss of that respect. So talking about the challenges of water around the world today, you can use Muslim arts and cultures as a case study to talk about how important it is to recognize these elements around use and perusal of water today. So that is what I mean by coming up with innovative themes that go beyond the Islamic art discourse, that go beyond the conventional ways of looking even at Islamic history, but to always look consistently for a connection between your artwork or your exhibition or your program and what is actually going on in the world today. I also have a dream that our museum one day could be an active tool of cultural diplomacy, where our mandate and our collections become tools of conversation in areas where we are active through other agencies in the network, in, you know, and uh, where we then complement what our partners or our family, as I always call it, is working through um, education or social or economic development. We come in driving home the same convictions and the same aspirations, but using arts and culture as the vehicle. That is the the dream I have. Dr. Al Hamis, I think that's the perfect note to end on. So we'll end it right there. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Dr. Al Hamis, for your time and your insight. I really appreciated how you connected art with the story that it tells. So now that we are aware of where the museum is heading, what can we expect from the museum's offerings? Well, their current exhibition, Remastered, is available to everyone right across the country. All you have to do is log on to remastered.agakanmuseum.org. To give some insight into this exhibition, here is Dr. Michael Chagnon, the museum's curator. Hi, my name is Michael Chagnon, and I'm curator at the Aga Khan Museum. I'd like to welcome you today to Remastered. Remastered was inspired by the current moment that we find ourselves in, in a time when the global COVID-19 pandemic has really driven a lot of people to seek solace in the arts, in their loved ones, uh, and within themselves. What we wanted to do was look inward at the museum's extraordinary collection, to find works of art that speak to the common human need to find courage in moments like this, to find love amongst each other, and really to look at the past for models of how to behave and to be human in the present moment and into the future. The exhibition features 11 stations, each focusing on an individual manuscript from the Persian, Turkish, or Mughal Indian traditions. These 11 stations are divided into three themes courage, love, and exemplary living. When we were going through our collections to select objects for this exhibition, we wanted to find works that really spoke to these themes that connect us both to our deepest past as humans, but also to our present and as we think forward into the future. We also wanted to find works that truly exemplify the extraordinary quality of the collection here at the Aga Khan Museum. So what you'll see when you come through are just exemplary works of Islamic painting through the ages. For the exhibition, the Aga Khan Museum partnered with Ryerson University Library to create immersive digital engagements with manuscripts and paintings from the collection, bringing a 21st century perspective onto 15th to 17th century works of art. These digital interventions offer new ways of seeing and understanding illustrated manuscripts, activating their pictures through motion, expanding them into three dimensions, adding layers of context and interactivity, and even reversing the passage of time. 
The first section of the exhibition is called The Courageous Spirit, and here we wanted to highlight the different forms of heroism that you encounter in the Islamic literary and visual traditions. One of the paintings that we showcase here is from the Shah Tamasp Shahnameh. One of the ways that many of us have come through this crisis is by finding solace in loved ones. Love in its many guises has been one of the most enduring preoccupations in human history. The Islamic world's literary and artistic traditions have explored the theme of love with great emotional depth and great ingenuity. The second section of the exhibition focuses on this theme of love, of our connection to one another in both its pains and its pleasures. When we find ourselves confronted by difficult tasks or decisions, we can sometimes look to the wisdom of the past and seek answers. This section of the exhibition features illustrated manuscripts of advice literature, whether they're fables or mirrors for princes, which is a literary genre that provides advice for wise rulership to burgeoning young leaders. The lessons transmitted in these manuscripts remain relevant today when ethical behavior, good governance, and illuminating insights can help us navigate world-shaping challenges. Some of the paintings have been animated, where we activate these illustrations to create a visually dynamic effect. It's comparable to the viewing experience of these lustrous paintings by flickering candlelight centuries ago. Several of the paintings on view have been translated from two dimensions into three dimensions using holographic displays. This enhances our comprehension of the spatial logic in Persian, Ottoman, and Mughal painting. Lastly, we worked with our partners at Ryerson University Library to digitally restore damaged works of art to approximate how these illustrations looked when they were originally completed. I think this exhibition has a little bit of something for everybody. If you miss a traditional museum experience because you've been isolated at home during the COVID crisis, this is definitely an exhibition for you. We've put on view some of the greatest masterpieces in the Aga Khan Museum collection, and you really have uh, an immersive experience and a, a unique experience with these works of art. If you're interested in digital technology on the cutting edge, the four intervention types that we offer here will really grab you and bring these works of art to life. What I hope people take away from this exhibition is that works from the past really do remain relevant today and that we can look to these works not only to find enjoyment and pleasure and perhaps even a form of escape, but really to learn something as well about our own selves as humans. Thank you. I love that exhibition. I find it so cool the way you can bring ancient pieces of art to life. Now, as I mentioned, you don't have to be in Toronto to experience this exhibit. Just visit remastered.agakanmuseum.org to virtually walk through this thought-provoking and relevant display. Now, for those of you in the Toronto area, the Aga Khan Park is hosting Spring is Here until April 25th, 2021. The exhibition is a series of five installations with 20 colorful panels that show us where and how spring traditions came to be. So sit back and enjoy this taste of this unique offering.
I have to say, that's an interesting and unique way to learn more about the roots of common spring symbols and the connections to countries and cultures far away. Now, one area of the museum it's almost impossible to walk past without checking out is the Aga Khan gift shop. The Aga Khan Museum store works to promote the mission of the museum as a whole by carefully selecting unique pieces with rich stories that support generational artisans. Showweb Guadri, retail operations executive and product design specialist at the Aga Khan Museum, is here to provide a little glimpse into the careful selection of the pieces available through the AKM gift shop. Hi, welcome to the Aga Khan Museum virtually. I'm Shoheb Guadri, Senior Retail Operations Manager and Product Designer. We're here in one of my favorite rooms, Divan Restaurant, here at the museum. Created at the turn of the 19th century, the elaborately decorated panels of the Damascus Room once adorned the walls and the ceiling of a private residence in the old town of Damascus. The panel's glistening surfaces evoke sumptuous textiles such as silk embroideries, carpets, or brocades. The beauty of these panels are very similar to the many products on offer within the museum shop, a destination for unique, one-of-a-kind art pieces for your home or gifting, all inspired by the museum's permanent collection and traveling exhibitions. One of my favorite pieces in the shop is this beautiful Iznik vase inspired by the ceramics within our own Bellarive room. This was handmade by an artist named Selahattin Tek, based out of Istanbul, Turkey. He has taken inspiration from the Aga Khan collection and has used fifth generations old techniques in creating these designs. He truly makes it a family of affair where his wife, will actually stencil the designs. Selahattin himself will go back and paint these beautiful decadent colors. And his two boys will then fire up these unique one-of-a-kind pieces, being ever so careful about how long they stay within the kiln. The museum shop is special because we support over 250 artists across 25 countries ensuring that their livelihoods are protected and that their craft abilities are celebrated for future generations. We hope that you visit us here at the museum when we open up, or you can easily visit us online at shop.agakhanmuseum.org where you will find many beautiful pieces such as this, all with beautiful stories telling of the artisan's life and their passion for decadent design and for carrying on the very traditions that are so important and so special to them. Thank you and have a lovely night. Thanks Shohib for that insight and for providing direct access to such beautiful pieces from around the Muslim world and beyond. All right, I promised you a game earlier and now is that time to test your knowledge of the Aga Khan Museum with the family favorite, Kahoot Quiz! I thought that'd be more exciting. To participate in tonight's Kahoot Quiz, simply open the Kahoot app or visit kahoot.it and enter the game pin shown on your screen. Are you ready? Let's start. Question 1. The first exhibition featuring works in the Aga Khan Museum was A. Word of God, Art of Man, The Quran and Its Creative Expressions B. Spirit and Life C. Visions of Mughal India, The Collection of Howard Hodgkin D. Remastered The correct answer is Spirit and Life. Question 2. Who designed the Aga Khan Museum structure? A. Charles Correa B. Vladimir Jurovich 
C. Thomas L. Waltz. D. Fumihiko Maki. The correct answer is Fumihiko Maki. Question 3. The Aga Khan Museum is the first museum dedicated to the arts of Islamic civilizations in A. The world, B. The west, C. North America, or D. The north. The correct answer is North America. Question 4. The newest addition to the permanent collection of the museum is A. A blue Quran featuring Arabic and a Kufic script in gold ink. B. Kumbisale, a 30-foot squared sculpture made of 100,000 black Legos. Ooh, that sounds cool. C. A planispheric astrolab with inscriptions in Arabic, Latin, and Hebrew. Or D. An inzik dish with blue lion and tulips. The correct answer is Kumbi Sale. Question 5. The museum's permanent collection includes art from the following period. A. Ottoman Empire B. Mughal Empire C. Fatimid Empire or D. All of the above The correct answer is all of the above. Question 6. The opening ceremony for the Aga Khan Museum was A. July 12th, 2007 B. May 28th, 2010 C. September 12th, 2014 or D. May 28th, 2015 The correct answer is September 12th, 2014. Question 7. Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble performed at the Aga Khan Museum when? A. September 2014 B. September 2015 C. September 2016 or D. June 2020 This was a tricky one. The correct answer is September 2015. Question 8. The new rapid transit station that will serve the Aga Khan Museum will be named A. Ismaili Center B. Aga Khan Park and Museum C. Spirit and Life D. Winford The correct answer is Aga Khan Park and Museum. Question 9. This is a past temporary exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum. A. The World of the Fatimids. B. The Moon, A Voyage Through Time. C. Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time. D. All of the Above. The correct answer is all of the above. All right, it's time for question 10, the final question. 
Referring to the museum, Molana Hazri Mam said, quote, My hope is that the museum will also be a center of blank and of blank, and that it will act as a catalyst for mutual understanding and tolerance. So what are those two blanks? A, education, learning. B, expression, dialogue. C, peace, learning. D, education, frankness. The correct answer is education and learning. Okay, so I may not have gotten all the questions right, and I probably mispronounced some of the words, so I apologize for that. But what is important is that I got the highest score against my family. That's because I'm alone. How did you do? Now tonight we have another entry into our COVID conversation segment. This piece by Vox helps us understand why comparing different vaccines is not straightforward. This is the new one-dose COVID-19 vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. In early March, more than 6,000 doses were supposed to be shipped to the city of Detroit, Michigan. But the mayor said, no thanks. Moderna and Pfizer are the best. And I am going to do everything I can to make sure the residents of the city of Detroit get the best. He was referring to these numbers, the vaccine's efficacy rates. The vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna have super high efficacy rates, 95 and 94 percent. But Johnson & Johnson, just 66. And if you only look at these numbers, it's natural to think that these vaccines are worse than these. But that assumption is wrong. These numbers are arguably not even the most important measure of how effective these vaccines are. To understand what is, you first have to understand what vaccines are even supposed to do. A vaccine's efficacy rate is calculated in large clinical trials when the vaccine is tested on tens of thousands of people. Those people are broken into two groups. Half get the vaccine and half get a placebo. Then they're sent out to live their lives while scientists monitor whether or not they get COVID-19 over several months. In the trial for Pfizer-BioNTech, for example, there were 43,000 participants. In the end, 170 people were infected with COVID-19. And how those people fall into each of these groups determines a vaccine's efficacy. If the 170 were evenly split, that would mean you're just as likely to get sick with the vaccine as without it. So it would have a 0% efficacy. If all 170 were in the placebo group and zero people who got the vaccine were sick, the vaccine would have an efficacy of 100%. With this particular trial, there were 162 in the placebo group and just eight in the vaccine group. It means those who had the vaccine were 95% less likely to get COVID-19. The vaccine had a 95% efficacy. Now this doesn't mean if 100 people are vaccinated, five of them will get sick. Instead, that 95% number applies to the individual. So each vaccinated person is 95% less likely than a person without a vaccine to get sick each time they're exposed to COVID-19. And every vaccine's efficacy rate is calculated in the same way. But each vaccine's trial might be done in very different circumstances. So one of the biggest considerations here uh, when we look at these numbers is the timing in which these clinical trials were performed. This is the number of daily COVID-19 cases in the U.S. since the pandemic began. The Moderna trial was done completely in the U.S., here in the summer. The Pfizer-BioNTech trial was primarily based in the U.S. too, and at the same time. Johnson & Johnson, however, held their U.S. trial at this time, 
when there were more opportunities for participants to be exposed to infections. And most of their trial took place in other countries, primarily South Africa and Brazil. And in these other countries, not only were case rates high, but the virus itself was different. The trials took place as variants of COVID-19 emerged and became dominant infections in these countries, variants that are more likely to get participants sick. In South Africa, most of the cases in the Johnson & Johnson trial were that of the variant, not the original strain that was in the U.S. over the summer. And despite that, it still significantly reduced infections. If you're trying to make one-to-one, head-to-head comparisons between vaccines, they need to have been studied in the same trial, with the same inclusion criteria, in the same parts of the world, at the same time. If we were to take Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine and redo their clinical trial at the same time that we saw did J&J's clinical trial, we might see quite different efficacy numbers for those. These efficacy numbers really just tell you what happened in each vaccine's trial, not exactly what will happen in the real world. But many experts argue this isn't even the best number to judge a vaccine by anyway, because preventing any infection at all is not always the point of a vaccine. The goal of a vaccine program for COVID-19 is not necessarily to get to COVID-0, but it's to tame this virus, to defang it, to remove its ability to cause serious disease, hospitalization, and death. It helps to look at the different outcomes of an exposure to COVID-19 like this. The best case scenario is you don't get sick at all. The worst case is death. In between, there's being hospitalized, severe to moderate symptoms, or having no symptoms at all. In the absolute best circumstances, vaccines give you protection all the way to here. But realistically, that isn't the main objective of COVID-19 vaccines. The real purpose is to give your body enough protection to cover these possibilities. So if you do get an infection, it feels more like a cold than something you'd be hospitalized for. And this is one thing that every one of these COVID-19 vaccines do well. In all these trials, while some people in the placebo groups were hospitalized or even died from COVID-19, not one fully vaccinated person in any of these trials was hospitalized or died from COVID-19. One thing that I wish that Mary would have understood was that all three vaccines have essentially 100% effectiveness in protecting from death. The mayor of Detroit did backtrack and said he'd start taking Johnson & Johnson doses because it's still highly effective against what we care about most. Efficacy matters, but it doesn't matter the most. The question isn't which vaccine will protect you from any COVID infection, but which one will keep you alive or out of the hospital? Which one will help end the pandemic? And that's any of them. The best vaccine right now for you is the one that you're offered. With each shot that goes in someone's arm, we get closer to the end of this pandemic. You know, that wasn't just enlightening. It was also educational and I think very timely in terms of where we are in our vaccine rollout. I know I can't wait to get my vaccine. Now, as always, we end with some musical expressions. For the musical expressions this week, we have a special performance filmed at the Aga Khan Museum in February 2020. Baba Mal is a Senegalese musician who trained in Dakar and Paris. Now, some of his notable accomplishments, aside from performing at the Aga Khan Museum, include being a United Nations youth emissary and performing the Wakandan soundtrack for the movie Black Panther. Here he is performing Dunia Salam, meaning world peace at the Aga Khan Museum. Thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been an absolute pleasure for me to be your host. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, healthy, and make some time to do something positive for your mental health. Good night.
Yeah. Thank you of promoting peace and love and respect between human beings. This song talks about peace. If you want peace, you have to do everything that is going to bring peace to your life. And if you get it, you have to keep doing peace. And to change peace into peace all, all the time.
otra solo Thank you! 